We're here for an editorial board meeting on Amendment 2. We've uh, asked the Vote No on 2 campaign to provide us some uh, guests to explain to us uh, their positions on the Second Amendment, the Medical Marijuana Amendment. So, gentlemen, thank you for joining us, and would you please uh, identify yourself and talk a little bit about your background. Uh, good morning. Yes, I'm uh, Ken Bell. I'm from Pensacola. Um, my family's been in Florida since about 1815. I was a board-certified real estate attorney. I was a circuit judge for 12 years, presided over 27,000 cases of all varieties, including juvenile and criminal. I was uh, appointed to the Florida Supreme Court. Uh, I resigned from the Florida Supreme Court uh, about six years ago. I'm back in private practice as an appellate attorney and um, practicing all across the state. And good morning, I'm Dr. Jeff Panazzo. I'm an emergency room physician. I'm the chair of emergency medicine at NCH North. And I'm here as a medical practitioner to hopefully provide you some answers to the medical questions you may have. I too do not have a specific uh, political agenda on this, and nor a, a, a specific association. I'm speaking on behalf of myself and to provide some answers if you have questions regarding medical marijuana use. Okay, very good. Um, we have had the uh, uh, advocates for Amendment 2 in here, and uh, essentially they have taken the position that it's indisputable uh, in science that medical marijuana can help patients. Uh, do you gentlemen agree with that in terms of the science, or do you dispute that? Well, I'll take the science uh, question, medical science question. Um, I dispute that completely. Um, the fact is that the, the evidence that we do have, um, the evidence-based medicine that we do have, is contrary to that view. I refer you to a recent study in New England Journal of Medicine to review, uh, that has gone over a thorough review of this issue, and it has found numerous flaws uh, in regard to the use of, of marijuana, particularly the inhaled type of marijuana. And um, at best, I would state that the um, that maybe some uses of medicinal uh, marijuana forms like Marinol and others require some additional medical study before you can just say a carte blanche. Yes, it's a it's a um, no you know it's a it's a no brainer and quote a standard of care. It certainly is not a standard of care. The Charlotte's Web version that was approved by the legislature, do you think that there's uh, then also faulty science with that? That also, I think, has uh, some, it's, it's helpful. The Charlotte's Web has been helpful, but I believe that that also, we need to look into some structured, scientific-based studies to determine who best to treat with uh, Charlotte's Web or substances similar to it and then apply that to, to a scientific-based process of disseminating that to our patients. And though I'm not the scientific expert, his, his position is consistent with the American Medical Association and the American Psychiatric Association. They take the same position. There's a concern about the level of marijuana being a Schedule One drug and there not being access to enough research. And I know personally, I think there needs to be the double line studies and the research done to get the full benefit of the chemicals within marijuana. But I think his position is consistent with the national organizations as well as the Florida Medical Association. Let's uh, shift here to another thing that uh, has been and said, and let's get that out of the way if we could. Um, and that is that the Florida Supreme Court put this on the ballot, so therefore they support it. We've heard some advocates of this amendment yeah. say that. Yeah. So could you please address the system uh, for uh, that's in place to get something on the ballot? Yeah, I'd be happy to do that. This amendment was placed on the ballot by init what we call initiative. So some people in favor of the amendment drafted some language, hired lawyers to help draft it, and then they file a, uh, they have to get enough votes signed, which they did, and they Typically in these days, they pay voters, they pay people to go out and get the signatures on it, and it's a very expensive proposition. And then they file a petition with the Florida Supreme Court that has a very, very limited role. And I, and, and I was on the court, and I, and I had to rule on these initiative petitions. And the court's role is very, very narrow. 
the court role's role is just essentially to make sure that the ballot title and summary are not misleading and fairly depict what the um, amendment does. They don't rule on whether it is a good idea, a bad idea, whether it should go in the Constitution or not. And in this case, the decision was four to three. So three of um, the uh, justices on the court uh, said no, uh, it is not a fair uh, summary of what the actual text, because all the voters see when they go into the booth to vote is a very short title and a very short summary um, that's limited in, in words, and um, they don't see the full text of the amendment. And that's part of the problem and why seven former justices, including five former chief justices, have uh, written an opinion, an editorial opinion, where we urge, uh, whether you think that medical marijuana is a good idea or a bad idea, is irrelevant because Amendment 2 is so poorly written that um, the adverse consequences far uh, outweigh any beneficial consequence. So this is not something that should be in the Constitution at all, in your opinion, or is it? I don't think, I don't, there is no other provision in our Constitution that protects one drug in one industry. Um, our Constitution is basically set up to, to define our basic rights and our form of government. So you get the three branches of government and education and how do you fund the system and whatever. It, it's the bare bones. I don't think it should be in the Constitution because this is a huge policy decision and um, I think you need to be able to tweak it and change it when you pass a law and that's why we have policymakers. We live in a democratic republic form of government where we um, elect representatives who, who struggle over hard decisions and um, they develop legislation and they try it out and when it doesn't work they tweak it. You can't tweak it when it's in the Constitution. You have to go through that whole process and reamend it. So yes, I think it's a. This is something that does not belong in the Constitution. If it were in the Constitution at all, I think the way to do it would be to say something real simple, like we believe that the people in Florida who have debilitating conditions should have access to the beneficial um, use of marijuana or cannabis and then leave it to the legislature to define how that plays out and then then the legislature assigns it to the executive branch who develops the rules and, and carries those out. I think that's a huge danger of this is putting it in the Constitution and what's striking if you there are only two states where there is mar medical marijuana allow have a constitutional amendment. Both were passed in 2000 and one is Nevada and one is Colorado. And if you compare those two amendments to this one, you can see why this one is so poorly written and so dangerous in, in, in my view. And there's several, if I can explain that, I will. Um, can I explain that? Um, yeah, absolutely. Let's get into some of the particulars of the Okay, wording. the first thing is, you, you question, okay, we need mar mar medical marijuana to help people who have debilitating medical conditions. So how do you define me uh, debilitating medical condition? This amendment, as Colorado and Nevada, lists specific ailments, conditions, diseases that no one would question is truly debilitating. But then the question becomes, other than the few illnesses that are listed and you have other conditions, who decides what those other conditions should be? In Colorado, that decision is left to a state agency. So if you believe your condition, marijuana would help your condition, you could go before that agency and prove that it would be beneficial and they could add it to the list. In Nevada, that was left to the legislature. In this amendment, it says... If, we, if you look at the text of the amendment, it talks about a debilitating condition and it lists um, AIDS, hepatitis C, and, the, and, and other diseases. And then it says, or other conditions for which a physician believes that the medical use of marijuana would likely outweigh the pot potential health risk for a patient. So it leaves it strictly up to a physician. It doesn't have to be a medical doctor. 
A physician under Florida statute can be a chiropractor, a podiatrist, optometrist. Um, and um, if you look at the Nevada, oh no, excuse me, I think it's Colorado statute, it says a doctor of medicine when it says physician, it specifically says doctor of medicine. So this amendment doesn't expressly limit it to a doctor of medicine. And even if it did list, list, leave it to a doctor of, of, of medicine, it doesn't even say it has to be an ongoing treating physicians. The other amendments say there has to be some ongoing physician-patient relationship. And as a circuit judge, I presided over the first case in the country where one physician in the small town of Milton um, had a pill mill in Santa Rosa County where Milton sits, was second only to New York in the distribution of Oxycontin. Um, it doesn't take, most physicians are wonderful people, it doesn't take very many physicians who really don't care about the consequences of it, and, and the doctor can speak to this because he sees it himself, but um, I think it's, the, the amendment is, that's the most dangerous part of this amendment, and then what it does that neither of the other two constitutional amendments do, and no other state does to my knowledge, it grants immunity to the physician and the patient and what they call the caregiver and the treatment center. Not only from criminal liability, but from civil liability or any other sanctions. So when it was argued before the case and one of the justices asked the attorney arguing for the proponents of the amendment, well, how broad is this? He said, well, sore throat, you know, headaches. As long as the physician thinks that the health benefits outweigh any risk, it doesn't matter what condition, and there would be no, no ability for the legislature or the government to step in and say, no, 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 that's not what we're, you know, a little bit of anxiety about an upcoming test or a sore throat is not what we meant by a debilitating condition. That's the biggest weakness. Adding to that the, the broad immunity from both criminal and civil liability, which no other state does, particularly in a constitutional provision. Dr. Panazzo, can you address yeah, whether I, we're going to have a trust in our doctors to all do the right thing here? Well, or is this? well I agree with my uh, distinguished panel mate here on that, that view. The, uh, the physician part of this amendment has me greatly concerned um, because it's not clear and it's not certain how that physician will, where that physician will come from, what the physician's background will be required. And as an example, all practicing physicians in Florida and throughout the country uh, have to be credentialed and licensed with their board of health in the state that they practice in or states that they practice. In addition, you have to and must maintain a DEA certificate in order to have the right uh, to prescribe certain medications and you have to apply for certain classes of those medications. And it's not s certain to me that the, um, the, the, uh, the, the uh, amendment has the power behind it to ensure that uh, the, the physician is going to be properly monitored and uh, is uh, properly monitoring the patient as uh, totally contrasted with a physician with a valid DEA who sees a patient in a common office setting and a uh, medical decision making process occurs and an appropriate set of medical therapies are addressed to the patient, including risk-benefit ratios of that therapy, and so on. And with that loophole, therein lies the opening to the unintended consequences, which are real, they're significant, and potentially catastrophic. What are those things? Uh, one, one is that the, the there's uh, not, that I understand, a way that the me medications would be administered and um, dispensed. And the dispension of those medications will inevitably get into the wrong hands. And um, as a board member for Collier Drug, Drug Free Collier, I um, am concerned about our children in our community. I'm concerned about our children having a misadventure because of that, a misadventure with the medications that would be profound and bring them to the hospital, to our care, with a situation that we can uh, and we agree on is completely avoidable. And if I can pick up on the um, impact on children, and, and that is another 
huge difference in this proposed constitutional amendment from if you just compare it with Nevada and Colorado. In Colorado, its medical marijuana amendment limited to those 21 years of age or older. There's no age limit here. Uh, in Nevada, the constitutional amendment specifically said that if it was to be given to minors, you had to have not only the physician certification, but you had to have parental knowledge and consent, and you had to have parental, um, the parents had to acquire and supervise the use of the drug. None of those protections are in this proposed constitutional amendment. Um, there is no provision for parental consent and knowledge. There's no, the, no provision for parental acquiring, the parents acquiring the marijuana and supervising the use of it. That's not in the constitutional provision. So that's way, way, way too broad for what he sees and what I saw uh, as a circuit judge. And what is clearly, the, the, the clear science is proven, and he can speak to that, about the adverse impact on developing brains and psychiatric conditions on adolescents and up to the age of 24 or 25 years of age. That science is, 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 is undisputed. So while we want to help people who have debilitating medical conditions if, if the components of marijuana are, are helpful, you also have to, if you're truly compassionate, you have to also have concerns about the minors and the youth and, and the kids and the long-term impact of that, and I'll let him speak to that. Well, pick pick the pick the problem, pick a, you know, a pregnant lady using uh, marijuana, and we encounter patients commonly uh, in our in my practice that arrive and uh, they find out they're pregnant, and they've had uh, a history of recent substance abuse, including marijuana, alcohol, tobacco, and we know the effects of the uh, fetus on that. So there's an unintended consequence that will not be uh, that will be easier to, uh, uh, to cause more problems if this amendment passes and there's not the type, type of amendment that is required to monitor the proper use, like a DEA uh, type of process. Uh, we're seeing more and more uh, marijuana use that brings patients into the emergency department. In fact, it's, it's uh, become the highest drug of abuse of patients that come to an emergency department more than heroin, more than cocaine currently. It's the number one drug that we're seeing that's abused. The IQ uh, effects of chronic use of marijuana are significant and proven. It's science-based. Uh, patients that are using marijuana on a regular basis will not, adolescents, will not achieve the same uh, educational IQ advancements because of the chronic use of that drug. Um, and by chronic use, can you define that? As I understand that, that means simply just smoking it a couple times a week. Yeah, it's a regular. It's just the regular. It's a regular it's not heavy use. Regular use of of uh, marijuana, correct? Not uh, not heavy use. And those certainly those heavier use uh, subjects are uh, are subject to in, even further increased risk uh, of development in their uh, in their uh, intellectual capacities and so on. Um, it leads and this is well known, to uh, other substance abuse. In fact, it's a port of entry for other substance abuse that leads to multitude of medical problems that are serious and real. Stroke, kidney failure, mental development uh, uh, problems, uh, it goes on. Uh, car accidents, another one. Impairment of, uh, of a person that's driving a vehicle. See this, uh, unfortunately, all the time. We can police alcohol uh, and try and reduce the, the DUI with medical marijuana use, it's going to be additive and far, I believe, far increased in the uh, amount of uh, cases we'll see and also, I believe, the severity because of the impairment. And we've also put smartphones in patients' hands as well now. So you see it's an additive effect of problems which are, are uh, uh, compounding the, the issue, issue and I think make it clear that uh, this amendment doesn't have any um, use for us in our state and certainly in our community here in Collier County. Can I come back to uh, the dispensing issue that was uh, brought up? Uh, right now there are um, ways in place for Schedule 1 drugs to be dispensed to patients. Can you compare 
what's in this amendment with what exists now for the dispensing of a uh, Schedule One drug to a, a patient who has it prescribed for them? Well, um, Schedule One drugs have a very defined, uh, very closely monitored uh, 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 route of administration to the patients. Now, I'm a hospital-based physician, and so I rarely will um, will utilize a Schedule One uh, prescription as an outpatient basis. Um, but it's very closely monitored. The use of those drugs are very closely monitored. And in physicians that utilize those drugs in a schedule outside uh, a cl clinical facility, in other words, outside their office, um, those can be more closely monitored because of the DEA credentialing that they have. And from my understanding, and I, I asked the judge here to comment additionally on this, the um, amendment is not nearly uh, written in a profound uh, nature such that this DEA style of monitoring will occur. Oh, absolutely. Here you're really talking about not going to your local pharmacy with a trained pharmacist that has a um, FDA approved drug that has known quantities of THC or cannabinoids in it. You're talking about going to a pot shop with a physician's uh, certification, not a prescription. The, the physicians cannot prescribe this because of federal laws. And again, I don't have any problem with those laws being being um, re-looked at, particularly treating a marijuana as Schedule One drug. I do have a severe problem from my experience in, in training and background that, and the experience in California and other states with this, is that these pot shops have become a real problem. It's interesting, the Democrat cabinet, current governor of Colorado called their experiment reckless. Um, he took some heat for that. Uh, but I think Colorado is is the leader of this, and um, I think it's that experiment needs to be played out elsewhere because the risks are greater than the rewards or benefits here. Um, and if I can move on, the the last aspect that really concerned us as justices, and let me make it clear, the the seven justices who signed it, this is the first time in the history of Florida that I know seven former justices have come out and spoken on an amendment. So, and we don't do that from partisan politics or whether we believe marijuana is good or a bad idea. Simply from over 300 cumulative years of legal and judicial experience, looked at these uh, amendments, and we're talking of uh, justices from from. Um, Miami to Jacksonville to Orlando to Pensacola to Tallahassee, black, Cuban, white, I mean a good mix. So it's not a political or partisan or any other question other than with over 300 cumulative years of experience in, in the law and in constitutional law saying, hey, wake up, we don't want this in our constitution. And I've mentioned three or four other areas. The last area is the definition of caregiver. In this, in this provision, the, the caregiver is defined as anyone who's 21 years of age or older. If you look in, in, the, in Nevada, that constitutional amendment, the caregiver had to be one who was responsible for the daily care of the patient. Or in Colorado, it speaks it's to an attendant. Here, the only requirement is 21 years of age or older. That's just such a broad uh, loophole to, and the caregiver can have the ability to dispense, pick up and dispense the marijuana to up to five different people. So, you know, when you look at the ballot language and it says that caregiver, you know, I think of that as like when my dad died of Alzheimer's, my mom had dementia, that we would you know, I was a caregiver, or my sister, or somebody who's responsible for the day-to-day -day care would assist in getting the drug. Here, the only requirement in the Constitution is 21 years of age or older, and you can do it up to five people. I think that you could drive a Mack truck um, through that. Loophole. So you think they were just reckless in writing that language? Or was no. I would like to think it was reckless, but they're very, very bright, very um, experienced attorneys. I think it was an intentional effort to make marijuana as broadly available to people in Florida as they could make it under the guise of compassion treating people with truly debilitating conditions. And the uh, Florida Courier just came out against this yesterday and they talk about it and I, and I think there's a lot of truth to what they say is that, that this is big business. You've got 
national law firms dedicating 12, 14 member legal teams to advise the big marijuana industry that will be coming in if this amendment passes. I'd like to comment, mm -hmm. if I can, about a couple of the other um, negative effects of this uh, substance. Um, another is the uh, inhalation and smoking. And we know smoking is not good for our health, and, the, and most Americans understand that and realize that. Um, this uh, mar marijuana use will uh, increase the inhalation of various other toxins. Um, because it's not an FDA process of how the uh, drug is prepared, um, we won't know if there's contaminants in it, and we won't know for quite some time what the carcinogenic effects would be. We also can't follow and trace uh, patients who may have used a uh, collection of, of this marijuana because of the way the, the way the system is designed to dispense it uh, as opposed to a, a medication which can easily be monitored. Um, there's other effects that are significant and real and those are in a, uh, regular use with adolescents which we described now as one, uh, one or two times a week. Regular use can increase to increased uh, psychiatric illness, schizophrenia, uh, lung problems, bronchitis that can increase, uh, and heart attack. I mentioned stroke, but I didn't mention heart attack, which is also another real uh, concern. And in younger adulthood, a heart attack, which is more devastating because of the um, disability that a heart attack would have on a younger adult for productivity and participation in the remainder of their life. So, um, Is it the smoking of it, or is it the actual ingredients of marijuana that we just stroke a heart attack. Well, it's both uh, the smoking and the inhalation of a toxic substance into your lungs uh, is um, not a medicinal, generally a medicinal uh, uh, prescription. I don't tell patients, well, you know, you need to have a go get a pack of call, you know, pack of cigarettes, and uh, it's just not a prescription that's commonly given. In fact, we tell patients, hey, I don't, I think you should cut out the smoking, tobacco smoking, in your life. Um, um, you're, you know, you have smoker's lungs, you, uh, your lungs sound coarse, and these are very clear. When I listen to a patient's lungs who has smoked um, for periods of time through their life, there is a distinct difference in the sound their lungs make. And I'll tell them, hey, your lungs have, you have smoker's lungs. And um, if they're there for bronchitis or something else, on occasion, I'll, I, it is not surprising for us to find uh, a nodule and that nodule may progress into a cancer. And those are the, you know, those mm -hmm. are the things that, that have me concerned the most. And without being able to monitor the prescription, how, and the prescription process, like we do with the DEA, like we do with the FDA, this is the biggest problem. And not only Panamite tells me that, uh, that the, the situation in Colorado is even more out of control than, I, than I've heard. And uh, I don't think it's, uh, once again, I'll say, I don't think it's uh, the right thing for Florida and certainly not for Collier County. Um, Justice Bell, if we can come back to the caregiver thing uh, issue, um, you know, proponents say, well, there is a, a car that has to be given out by the Department of Health to a caregiver. Is there an understanding of what the criteria are in order to get that card from the Department of Health to be labeled a caregiver? No, that would be subject to interpretation by the legislature or the Department of Health. And should someone believe that interpretation is a little too constrictive, then there will be lawsuits uh, asking the courts to decide whether that is consistent with the constitutional provision. And when the drafter, and you mentioned whether this was a mistake or whatever by the drafters, that was my point in, in referencing Nevada in Colorado that had both had two constitutional amendments passed in 2000, 14 years ago. And for some reason they chose not to put the limitations that are clearly in there that protect against uh, the abuse. And I think that's one caregiver. They could have clearly defined that caregiver is one who's responsible for the regular daily care of a patient. They chose not to do that. They could have defined it as someone who's actually attending. Um, in the case that I provided, presided over with a physician in, in, in Milton, he had no ongoing treating relationship with uh, the patient. And um, I think that's putting that all together and granting criminal civil immunity from 
a pill mill doctor like the one I had in, in Santa Rosa mm -hmm. County, by this statute, he would be immune from criminal or civil sanctions uh, because of his certification in marijuana, because he doesn't have to be an ongoing treating physician. He doesn't have to get parental consent. He can give it to a caregiver, quote unquote, who can give it up to five um, different people. The loopholes are just too broad, too dangerous to place in our Constitution. And see, the way the proponents, you ask, you know, the proponents of this, the way to do this is not a blue ribbon commission after you draft it and after it gets passed. You have a blue ribbon commission ahead of time and you take care and you see the prior statute and prior constitutional amendments and you say, okay, we need this medical marijuana to help people who are really hurting and they can't get relief by other regular medications. Okay, this is our goal. Then what do we do to make sure that we're compassionate enough to assure that reaching that goal doesn't have adverse side effects and consequences? And so you get with law enforcement, you get with physicians, and you get with other groups, and you tweak it. For those who are concerned with adolescents, you provide for parental consent. For those who are concerned about pill mill type doctors, you, you, you get another physician or something else involved in it. And you leave it to the legislature to tweak it as it's experimented. As Hillary Clinton said, you know, when she was asked about this, she said, it's from the federal level, she said, it, this is still at a very experimental stage, and we got we have to see how that experiment plays out. We see that in Colorado, and the Democratic governor now saying it was a reckless idea. This is reckless, uh, and I think that they had the ability to avoid a lot of the unintended consequences, and being bright lawyers having the availability of the, those two amendments and the other statutes, I can't reach any other inclusion that they intentionally wrote it very broadly, very vaguely, in order to make the door open to marijuana use as broadly as it could be under the guise of helping people with debilitating conditions, truly debilitating conditions. If this was a um, if if this was a scientific based study, it would have been pulled back by now. You talk about it being an experiment, and Hillary Clinton commenting about it, and uh, and I agree with that. If if this was, that study would be pulled and it would be restructured to cover the things that Judge here has, has referred to, and to um, look at the um, ways to mitigate the unintended consequences. It would not continue. But we do know and we do agree that um, evidence-based medicine should be the way to move on with this, to determine what medical marijuana use and what that form would be um, to more adequately treat. But, this, but, the, but I believe it will be significantly limiting and limited. But I believe strongly as a judge here that um, if we were to uh, not um, have the practitioners, the physicians and the medical um, physicians that are uh, intimately in contact with the patient and monitor their treatment with the substance. I think it has a disastrous um, consequences that we'll keep hammering uh, to the, I'll keep talking about to this day because it's our children that we have to protect. Our children don't know. They, they look to us for guidance and they look to us for the intelligent answers. So we need to think about that as seriously as possible. If we could uh, uh, hit one on the other back and forth that we've heard here. We've heard uh, the advocates of Amendment 2 saying you're forcing people who have cancer and ALS and etc. to break the law if they feel medical marijuana will help them. We've heard the Cotter County Sheriff's Office here say we're not in the business of hauling off cancer patients and ALS uh, patients to jail. Um, from your time on the bench, have you seen much in terms of law enforcement going after and, and hauling in people and putting those cases through the court system? I've never. The 27 some thousand cases that I presided over as a circuit judge, I never saw law enforcement uh, go after somebody who was using marijuana for truly medicinal purposes. They have so much they have to deal with. They are typically compassionate, and um, I never saw that. Well, we have Marinol. Marinol is, um, 
it is uh, approved for use, and Marinol uh, needs more study. Um, and Marinol is what? is is a um, is a orally uh, taken substance, not inhaled, that has um, has use for some of the more medicinal qualities to uh, to the needs for patients for quote medical marijuana um, needs, and Marinol may have more impact, and it's available now, and there are. Uh, patients in our community that utilize Marinol through a, a more FDA approved process. And Marinol is derived from marijuana. Marijuana. Right. Uh, one last question and then we'll uh, leave it to you all to answer any other uh, things that you address, any other things you haven't. One of the other things we've heard the advocates say is, okay, 23 states have understood the need to do this and DC has understood the need to do this, so why shouldn't Florida? For all the reasons that you cited here, or they're using the 23 other states are doing this, so why not Florida? 21 of the other states did it through the legislature. As a lawyer, a former justice on Florida Supreme Court, sworn to uphold the Constitution that I love, I will, if we're going to take the route of 21 other states, do it legislatively. If we're going to do it as the two other states have done, Nevada and Colorado, and do it by constitutional amendment, then it has to be done in a way that provides the protections that those amendments did that this, this one does not. Any final closing comments either of you want to add to this? No. I think the only conclusion that I would get is I think that marijuana may have the ability, as in Marinol and other forms, to, to provide relief. I have a sister that has um, the dinner disc disease. Um, she suffers from extreme pain. And I've seen the adverse consequences of medicines that we have now, pain medication. It's really debilitating mentally and emotionally and, and otherwise. So I think, as I think the AMA and the other physician groups have said, this needs to be studied. So I think that the, the, the method that you need to go by is, as we do with other substances, is work with Congress um, and get the, the Schedule One out of it or do what some of the other states have done and encouraged or provide for further research in it. But that research needs to be done, and I think the, the chokehold on the ability for researchers to do those studies that need to be done on marijuana because of the concerns of the Schedule One aspect and the federal laws, that needs to be addressed. And that should be done. This is simply putting the cart way before the horse. And until that, until you get it in the right order, where you remove the, the fear of researchers or the fear of um, scientists to study it adequately and do those, those long-term studies, um, that's the roadblock that needs to be moved. You don't jump through ahead of all of that and put it in the Constitution. Because I think, as I've said uh, several times, if you look at in those other states, people are ruining how broadly it's impacting. And if you look at, he mentioned um, driving under the influence. If you look in Colorado, the incidence of people driving under the influence because of marijuana has, has skyrocketed. The number of homeless people, there's a recent article about homeless people all leaving Texas going to Colorado so they could uh, get their pot. I don't think we need that uh, here uh, in Florida. I think we need to address the issue. We need to make sure that people with debilitating conditions that can get better help than they're getting now through any product in marijuana should and be pursued, but it needs to be pursued in a wise way and in the right way. Yeah, if I, if, I mean, if I could, I would, I, I totally agree. I, I do understand there may be instances um, where uh, a medical marijuana type substance, and Marinol, I'll go back to Marinol, uh, there may be more to that than we've, uh, we've, we know, and I think more, uh, more research needs to go on and more study needs to go uh, in order to determine this. We know this, um, the euphoric aspect of the marijuana when inhaled um, is not what is the medicinal portion of the marijuana. It's the ca other cannabinoids that are in that. The comp it's a complex substance, and it's those other things that need to be looked at. In fact, the euphoric uh, component of it uh, re resolves, and um, if inhaled, 
those properties of marijuana, the inhaled form of marijuana, can actually cause more symptoms in patients that have chronic pain or a chemotherapy patient that has chronic nausea and vomiting. There may be, and there probably is more to this, but we need, it needs more science applied. Before you put a carte blanche amendment into the public without public understanding the science behind it and uh, result in the numerous uh, complications that could happen in our society.